This week on Channel 8 News, we'll take a look at the Spring Food Festival, celebration of quality, gun control, and fishing attacks. Channel 8 News starts right now. Thank you for tuning in to Channel 8 News. I'm Alex Sanchez. And I'm Shannon Clement. Mitch Baumberger had the opportunity to attend the International Student Organization Spring Food Festival. Mitch? On Wednesday the 28th, the International Student Organization put on a Spring Food Festival. I spoke with ABBA, the liaison for the recruitment chair of International Student Organization. It was the Spring Food Festival, so it's like a festival with like different festival a dinner with like different foods from like different places all over the all over the world but we had different performances from like people from all over the world too we had a few speakers so it was just like a big dinner i spoke with the president of the organization valentine osakwe on the planning of such a large event events like this it's kind of hard to plan and things don't always stick and then especially when it's multicultural so you have to uh, think to you have to try to be considerate of not just what you want, but what another person wants. So many different platters from all different kinds of cultures and countries were being fed at this event. So we had food from Africa, we had fried plantains, we had samosas, we had jollof rice, um, we had food from India, we had types of chicken, we had like cottage cheese, um, cooked in like Indian spices, we had food from Nepal, we had food from Thailand, we had food from China, so like just different foods from different countries. We had some like European like um, pastries and stuff, so yeah, and Mediterranean, Mediterranean pastries, so just food from all over the world. To bring delicious international food to an event is one thing, but to entertain an audience while they eat is another. Put, let's put on a show for the campus. That was one of the things I thought about. Let's just for one night, just put on a show, an international show for the campus. Just bring everyone together, faculty, staff, students. Let them have a taste of something different. And what's the best way for people to go to events? It's food. So, hence, Spring Food Festival was born. To put on an event of this scale, you would have to raise a significant amount of money. Our total budget was around three thousand dollars. It was like twenty eight hundred something. So like, in like approximately, it was like three thousand um, dollars. We did not have a big budget of our own, but we did like a little bit of fundraising. Um, we asked for appropriation from with the student senate, and like they helped us out. So we like got to put with help from like different people. If you have ever considered joining the International Student Organization, now is the time to join. When people hear the word International Student Organization, they always think it's just for international students. Uh, I am an international student. Uh, Americans are international. What, like the speaker said, everybody has an international story. So uh, this is somewhere you go, you meet people that is not from your culture, uh, people that is uh, very different from you. Uh, people you normally will not meet on a day-to-day -day basis. Reporting for Channel 8 News is Mitch Bomber. Thanks, Mitch. Angela Luna got an inside look on phishing attacks happening in our emails. Angela? The university has recently released a warning about possible phishing scamming alerts in the form of possible job opportunities. I decided to sit down with a couple students to figure out if they've received the emails as well and if they've actually fallen for them. I've received at least three this week actually um, of like part-time position jobs that don't sound like they're legit at all. And then within, I think, 24 hours of receiving the notice that there would be more and more of those emails floating around and to watch out for them, I received at least three other ones saying to confirm my email or to send them something about you know, my email or my uh, account information or something like that, so. There have been a couple about like job opportunities as far as like, oh, click here, you know, for, you know, $500 an hour, or some like really unrealistic um, kind of pay. Um, last semester I got some that were like, um, something went wrong with registration or like something official, like, you know, like there's a, and they had like the, like the logo for Northwest and stuff, but it seemed really sketchy because like it, they didn't have like any like emblem at the bottom. It didn't say like who exactly 
exactly was sending it. It just gave like a first name and was just like, hey, put your information in, that kind of thing. And it was just really, it's kind of like the first time I got it before I heard that there was anything going on, I almost like opened it, but then I was like, yeah, I'm too busy for this. So I, I didn't. Um, and I'm really glad I didn't because apparently there were some like sketchy things going on with people sending stuff they weren't supposed to. I usually let my job know I work at Career Services. So we get lots of the students come through and say, hey, are you guys the ones sending us this information about the part time job or about the full time job? We're really interested. And we have to send them all an email saying, no, that's that's the fake emails. They're looking for your information. So don't answer back. I think there's been mass emails out to students and um, also warning teachers. So I think that's where like the group, the, like the mass emails went out to students from uh, from tech services over here. It's like our office was talking about it, and then like I know students from other offices were telling their bosses and their teachers, and so that's kind of why everyone knows that it's phishing. If you or any student here on campus who has received one of these emails, delete them immediately and let a university official know if you continue to receive these emails. Reporting for Channel 8 News, I'm Angela Luna. Thanks, Angela. When we come back, we'll take a look at your Northwest event report. Don't go away. Welcome back to Channel 8 News. I'm Shannon Clement. And I'm Alex Sanchez. And this is your Northwest Event Report. On Monday, April 2nd, from 3 to 5 p.m. in the Union Third Floor Ballroom, come celebrate others at the Northwest Awards and Recognition Night. The collaborative celebration recognizes excellence among Northwest students, faculty, and staff. In addition to the nominations being accepted for numerous awards, the ceremony will recognize Undergraduate Research Award winners and Tower Service Award winners. On Monday, April 2nd, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Memorial Bell Tower, pick up a t-shirt as part of the Northwest Week activities going throughout the week. All activities are free and sponsored by the Student Activities Council. On Monday, April 2nd, from 11 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. at the Centennial Garden, students are invited to stop by and pick up a free barbecue lunch. Choose from pulled pork or chicken quarters with sides of cheesy potatoes and beans with a drink. Arrive early as they will only be serving 250 lunches. On Monday, April 2nd through Friday, April 6th, students are invited to participate in a scavenging hunt by connecting with the Student Activities Council on Twitter. Gift cards to Maryville locations will be awarded to students who find a location or object related to a hint provided via Twitter. Follow SAC's Twitter at NW underscore SAC. On Monday, April 2nd, beginning at 7.30 p.m. in the Maryville High School Leonina Schneider Center for the Performing Arts, Kevin Bobo will perform in a percussion recital to conclude Northwest Visiting Artist Series Transformations Life in the Arts. The event is free and is open to the public. On Tuesday, April 3rd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the Union, Thank a Donor Day takes place. Students can come and share their gratitude by signing postcards to be sent to donors. Other activities will include a cat card based on the popular show Cash Cab. The annual event is designed to educate Northwest students about the importance of private donations from alumni, family, and friends. On Tuesday, April 3rd, from 11.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. in the Union Student Engagement Center, come speak with a nurse from Wellness Services about any health and wellness-related questions you may have. Each session has a theme, but you aren't limited to only those topics. On Tuesday, April 3rd, beginning at 7 p.m. in the Charles Johnson Theater, Rashid Ali Cromwell, founder and president of the Harbor Institute, will visit Northwest to present the Spring Frog Hop Diversity Lecture. During this lecture, Cromwell will use his legal and academic experiences to frame the cultural context and its relevancy in today's classroom. He leads an interactive discourse about the significance of increasing understanding, awareness, and sensitivity as it relates to cultural competency and education. This event is free and open to the public. On Wednesday, April 4th, at an informational table in the Union, hashtag Denim Day will be happening. Students, faculty, and staff are encouraged to wear denim for the survivors of sexual assault and victim blaming. Donations are also encouraged and all proceeds will be going to the Children and Family Center. Show your support with the hashtag Denim Day on social media. On Wednesday, April 4th from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. on the Union Third Floor, Mock Interview Day takes place. This day helps students gain interviewing experience by meeting face-to-face -face with real employers. Following the mock interviews, employers provide students with direct feedback 
on the resume, interview responses, and overall impression. Come out and get more experience, help for the future. On Wednesday, April 4th, from noon to 4 p.m. at the Memorial Bell Tower, glide through the air across campus on a zip line. This event is part of Northwest Week. On Wednesday, April 4th, from 7 to 8 p.m. in the Charles Johnson Theater, Northwest welcomes Lieutenant Governor Mike Parson as a guest in the Distinguished Lecture Series. Parson will share his experiences that helped him become the governor. There will also be a question and answer portion for those in the audience to ask any questions they have. On Friday, April 6th, beginning at 7.30 a.m., students are invited to grab a free donut as part of Northwest Week. Donuts are located in the Union, Colden Hall, Vox Center, Wells Hall, B.D. Owens Library, and the Garrett Strong Science Building. Arrive early to make sure you get a delicious donut while supplies last. On Friday, April 6th, from 3 to 4 p.m. in the Library Lounge, Room 108, another rendition of First Friday Cultural takes place. Students from around the world discuss their cultures and traditions and breaking down stereotypes. On Friday, April 6th, from 6.30 to 9 p.m. in the Horace Mann Gym, come out and enjoy yourself for an evening of English country dancing. Caller Jerome Girasani will lead us through the steps. For those who would like some instruction, he will also teach the basic dance steps beforehand at 6.30. Regency dress is welcome, but not required. This event is free and will be open to the public. Well, that's all the time we have for Northwest Event Report. When we come back, we'll take a look at some more recent news and events. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Channel 8 News. I'm Channing Clement. And I'm Alex Sanchez. Molly Gardner got the inside scoop on the celebration of quality. Let's take a look. On Friday, March 30th, students from all majors came together in the third floor of the Student Union for the annual Celebration of Quality. Assistant Professor of History Dr. Alyssa Ford helps organize this event every year and says it's a great way for students to showcase all the hard work they've done this semester. The Celebration of Quality is an academic symposium um, for students, both Missouri Academy undergraduate students and graduate students. Um, and what the symposium means is it's a place for students to come together and share and present the work, the research, different projects, things like that that they have been working on throughout the last semester and the last year. Um, and so we have this whole array of things that are happening. We've got science, computer science, um, history, education, political science, geography, almost every department on campus, probably every department on campus, um, has some students that are presenting. Um, and so I think this is a really great way for us to um, just kind of celebrate um, what the students are doing and for also them to be able to share it with the broader community here instead of just their friends or their classes. Ford adds if it weren't for the students, this event would not be possible. Additionally, um, this is something that is put on by the Society of President Scholars, and so they do a really great job um, helping get everything organized. Um, and so, and, and we get funding for this from the provost office. So that's really what allows this to happen. Um, if we didn't have that funding and didn't have the Society of President Scholars, this couldn't happen. So it's just really great that we have all of them involved, and then of course all of the students um, that want to participate and share their really great work. Ford also says students should keep an eye out for this event every spring. Students should um, think about this, always keep their eye out for it when it's coming up, when the announcements come out about it every um, spring. It usually comes out in early January, right when we get back from the fall break or um, winter break. Um, it's a really great experience to practice kind of presenting um, orally like this. And it's also a really great addition to have for your resume when you're looking for jobs, when you're looking for graduate schools, um, and different things like that. It always takes place in the spring, um, and we're trying to have it really regularly um, scheduled for the Friday, the first Friday after spring break. So it's late enough in the semester that hopefully if you're a senior and you're doing your like research, your big research seminar or capstone project that year, that you've gotten far enough along with it that you can still um, present here. Celebration of Quality takes place the first Friday after spring break every year. Students will have to register for this event a month in advance. Reporting for Channel 8 News, I'm Molly Gardner. Thanks, Molly. I had the opportunity to go out on the streets to get people's opinions on gun control. Let's take a look. 
I am out here at the Northwest Missouri State Campus asking people with their opinions on gun control and some things that they would like to see changed. Okay, so uh, I'm a gun owner, so I don't particularly support 100%, but I do see the positive effects of change, so maybe some restrictions on certain things like high-capacity magazines. I wouldn't be totally opposed to that either. So, Well, I think that um, guns should definitely be allowed certain places, but there are places where they don't belong. And um, I think the ways to get them are a little bit too easy. I actually work at a gun shop, and it only takes about 15 minutes for somebody to walk out the door. And um, that idea is kind of scary. I'm actually kind of neutral about it. Um, I think that hunting is good, and I think that we should also keep our right to bear arms. I think that's a big deal. Um, but I know that there's a lot of other things going on, so it, it's kind of hard to choose a side for me. Yeah, I definitely think there needs to be strict regulations when it comes to uh, guns. I'm not saying that we need to uh, completely take away the Second Amendment because I'm all for the Second Amendment, but I definitely think that when kids' lives are on the line, um, we definitely need to buckle down and be more strict when it comes to gun laws. Not only were students asked, but teachers as well. <laughs> well, it's a big subject. Uh, I grew up on a farm, and um, I'm all for hunters and and uh, having the right to have a gun and all that. But I, I guess I would, I would draw a line at military-style weapons. I, I don't really see the need for that as a, as a hunter. Um, I just think that gets to uh, increasing the danger level too much for society. So while I would support um, people continuing to be able to have, have guns for hunting or for self-protection or that sort of thing, I, I think some, some weapons are too dangerous for society. I think there will be more control over the, the types of guns that can be purchased by, by citizens. Mm -hmm. I think they'll probably, I know the bump stock, I think is what it's called. I think there's been some issues about that, and I, I think that's probably fine. Uh, some other types of, of guns, uh, I think there'll probably be some restrictions on that also. For most students, it was hard for them to make an opinion. Uh, so I personally um, don't have enough knowledge to like talk about politics and talk about gun control yes i have my own personal opinion but i personally don't think like we should be like choosing sides democrat democrats republicans um i just truly think that we do need to make some type of change uh just how we talk to each other and how we present um this issue to each other and how we do need to compromise um one fourth and just listen to each other's stories instead of attacking each other as far as interviewing goes, it was very hard to get people to talk to about gun control. As far as lawmakers go, it is unknown as to what they will do about gun control in the future. For KWT Channel 8, I'm Alex Sanchez. You know, it was really interesting to go out and get people's perspective on such a conflicting subject. It really does sound like it. Well, when we come back, we'll take a look at some national headlines. Don't go away. Welcome back to Channel 8 News, I'm Alex Sanchez. And I'm Shannon Clement. Recently, more and more cases about fraternity hazing have been appearing around the country. One case is still going on in Pennsylvania at Penn State University. Sophomore Timothy Piazza at 19 died February 4th, 2017 after drinking large quantities of alcohol during his first night of pledging Beta Theta Pi fraternity. His blood alcohol level went from zero to as high as 0.36 in 82 minutes after consuming 18 drinks. This fraternity was supposed to be alcohol free. As the case goes on, more charges keep getting dropped. A recent one was an involuntary manslaughter against five of the active members of Beta Theta Pi. Some other members still face charges, including conspiracy, hazing, and alcohol violations. This is the second time Judge Alan Sinclair has rejected involuntary manslaughter charges in this case. The charges keep being refiled by the uh, prosecutors, excuse me, the prosecutors want justice for Piazza's family and will continue to bring up more charges as they find them. 
For the second time, a judge in Center County dismissed involuntary manslaughter, reckless endangerment, and most other charges against 11 former Penn State fraternity members. The same judge dismissed many of the same charges last year after the first preliminary hearing when the former Center County District Attorney was in charge of the case. In February of last year, 19-year-old Timothy Piazza took part in a hazing ritual at the Beta Theta Pi fraternity house on the main campus of Penn State University. Investigators say he drank heavily before falling down several times. He later died. The second preliminary hearing for the fraternity brothers charged in connection with Piazza's death wrapped up yesterday at the courthouse in Belfont. Late this morning, the judge ruled that only five of the former fraternity brothers would have some of the lesser charges sent to trial. That's getting off way too easy because someone did die. I think they should do way more than just pay a fine and then like move on with their lives. Here on campus, we spoke with some parents who are less concerned about those charges and more worried about what this means for their children. Ultimately, obviously, our judicial system is independent and will make its own decisions, but I think most importantly for all campuses and not just in college, but actually high school that the, we learn about from these situations. In a statement, the Pennsylvania Attorney General said, quote, we will move forward with our case and the charges that were held for trial today. I am disappointed by the decision of the magisterial district judge, and we are assessing our legal options. My office is committed to seeking justice for Timothy Piazza and his family. With new evidence taken from the recovered basement video, seven new defendants plus another 10 who were already charged are expected back in court for a preliminary hearing in early May. Krishna Papa, Newswatch 16, Center County. Walmart announced recently that the retail company will no longer be selling the popular women's magazine Cosmopolitan in the checkout lines. The National Center of Sexual Exploitation said Walmart made the decision following conversations with the anti-pornography organization. The organization also said Walmart's removal of Cosmo from checkout lines is an incremental but significant step towards creating a culture where women and girls are valued as whole persons rather than as sexual objects. This may look good on Walmart now, but just wait until the women that regularly buy the magazine get to the checkout lines to find that their favorite magazine is no longer there. We'll have to see where it goes from here. President Donald Trump seems to be having a hard time finding a lawyer to help in the Russia probe. Five large law firms in Washington are passing on the opportunity to represent Trump after shakeup last week on his private defense team. These lawyers cited several reasons for declining the president in recent weeks. Among them, Trump appeared to be a difficult client and has rebuked some of the lawyers' advice. He's perceived as so politically unpopular, he may damage reputations rather than boost them. These lawyers fear backlash from their corporate clients if they were to take the case. And many want to keep clear of conflicts of interest that could complicate their other obligations. Trump needs someone to represent him, yet he seems to have scared everyone off. Maybe he'll need to take other steps in order to gain the trust back of those lawyers. Only time will tell. Flags were at half staff this past week in honor of Linda Brown, who passed away. Linda Brown was a schoolgirl at the center of the landmark U.S. Supreme Court case that rejected racial segregation in the infamous Brown v. Board of Education case of 1954. Brown was the start of the desegregation happening in public schools. As life went on, she became an educational consultant and public speaker. Linda Brown will be the name that will be remembered through only history books and stories now, but will for sure be a name that no one forgets. Linda Brown's walk here to the all-black Monroe Elementary School sparked a lawsuit that changed history. But as a third grader, she didn't realize it. And when school started, my friends would in fact, take their books and walk four blocks to the all-white school and I would have to be bused to clear across town. And I just didn't understand that. I only knew that I wanted to go to school with the children that I played with on a daily basis. You don't wake up as a, a young person saying that I'm going to change the world, but um, uh, for all she knew, she was groomed for it. Her father, Reverend Oliver Brown, was among 13 plaintiffs in the Brown vs. Board of Education case that led to the desegregation of schools. Linda was that movement's fearless face. She was so photogenic and um, you know, touched so many people through the photographs of her standing in front of the school. 
But behind closed doors, Linda shied from the spotlight. It was very difficult for her as a young person to be thrown in the spotlight because she was a quiet, or her, her, she wanted to be a quiet person. And so, but she grew into that uh, responsibility. Her friends remember a reserved, piano playing, poem writing person. Anyone that knew Linda, you loved her because she was just a kind, meek, type person. She was impeccably dressed. Her hair was ever out of place and her fingernails were to die for. The child of another plaintiff, Victoria Lawton Benson, often traveled with Linda, watching her fight for future generations. She believed in building legacy and doing things peaceably. Now that legacy lives on in more than just pictures. But if not for Brown, uh, there, there wouldn't be um, the talks that we have about gender equality, there wouldn't be the talks that we have about being ADA accessible. Um, see how uh, inclusive we're becoming as a society. All of that was really the snowball effect that occurred in 1954 and, and went forth. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. For more information on stories that matter to you, like us on Facebook at backslash KNWT8 or follow us on Twitter at KNWT8 News. Northwest Sessions is up next. From all of us here at Channel 8 News, I'm Alex Sanchez. And I'm Channing Clement. Have a good night.